Arahatamaga, 3. The Direct Route to the End of All Suffering. A compilation of Venerable Akariya Mahabhuawa's Dhamma Talks. About the development of his meditation practice. Please take this explanation as a guide, signaling the way forward, and not as a lesson to be memorized verbatim. I am always reluctant to be very specific for fear that my students will take my words literally and thus prejudge the nature of the truth that they are seeking. My words, taken as they are, will not enlighten you. Only mindful awareness, firmly anchored in the present moment, leads directly to the truth. Never presuppose the truth. Don't speculate or theorize about meditation practice. And don't mistakenly appropriate the knowledge you gain from reading this exposition, assuming that in doing so you understand the true nature of body and mind. Only clear and direct insight guided by mindfulness, investigated with wisdom, and pursued with diligence will penetrate that truth. At this level of practice, the body is completely internalized and the power of sexual attraction is broken. To move forward to the next step, you must use the meditation technique, that brought you to this point, as a training exercise. The aim here is to train mindfulness and wisdom to be even quicker, sharper and more precise in dealing with the very elusive and subtle nature of mental phenomena. Place the repulsive image of the body in front of you as usual and watch as it retracts into the mind. Then place the image back in front of you and start again, observing carefully how the image merges into the mind. Do this exercise repeatedly until the mind becomes very skilled at it. Once proficiency is achieved, the image will ebb away as soon as the mind focuses on it and merge with the knowing presence inside. Upon reaching the stage where one clearly understands the basic principles underlying sexual attraction, the next step is to train the mind with this purely mental exercise. Sexual attraction is no longer a problem it has been cut off for good there is no way that it can reappear as before. But, although most of it has been eliminated, it has yet to be completely destroyed. A small portion still remains, like bits of dross or patches of rust adhering to the mind. At the stage where external perceptions merge totally with the Siddha's own inner image, we can say that at least 50% of the investigation of Kamaraga has been successfully completed. The final, most advanced stage of the path of practice has been reached. The subtle portion of sensual desire that remains must be gradually eliminated, using the training exercise mentioned above. Relentlessly refining the contemplation and the mental absorption of Ajubha images will increase wisdom's skill level. As wisdom's proficiency strengthens, a higher and higher percentage of sexual attraction is totally destroyed. As wisdom's mastery gathers pace, so too does the speed at which the images recede into the mind. Eventually, as soon as one focuses on it, an image will rush into the mind, merge with it and simply vanish. With constant practice, the speed at which this occurs will rapidly increase. At the highest level of skillfulness, the image will vanish the moment it's absorbed into the mind. This investigative technique is fundamental to progress in the final stage of the path, the stage where a vanquished Kamaraga is in full retreat. Soon every vestige of it will be destroyed. Once the meditator attains the final stage, once the real source of ugliness and beauty is seen with crystal clarity, Kamaraga will never rear its head again. Its hold over the mind has been broken and this condition is irreversible. Notwithstanding that, further work is still needed to destroy all traces of sensual desire. The task is time consuming. This part of the investigation is complex and somewhat chaotic with images of the body arising and vanishing at a furious pace. The most intense effort is required to root out every last vestige of Kamaraga. But the meditator knows instinctively what to do at this stage. So, the investigation quickly develops its own natural momentum without prompting from anyone. Mindfulness and wisdom are habitual they work in unison with extraordinary speed and agility. By the time that these investigations reach their denouement, no sooner does an image of the body appear than it vanishes instantly. It doesn't matter whether these images merge into the Siddha or not, their appearance and disappearance is all that is known. Arising and passing images happen so quickly that perceptions of external and internal are no longer relevant. 
In the end, images flutter on and off, appearing and disappearing from awareness so rapidly that their forms are no longer sustainable. After each disappearance, the Siddha experiences a profound emptiness emptiness of imagery, emptiness of form. An extremely refined awareness stands out within the Siddha. As each new image flashes on and disappears, the mind feels the resulting emptiness more profoundly. Due to its subtle and manifest strength at this stage, the Siddha's knowing nature completely dominates. Finally, images created in the mind cease to appear altogether only emptiness remains. In this void the Siddha's essential knowing nature prevails, exclusively and incomparably. With the cessation of all body images created by the mind comes the total annihilation of Kamariga. Contemplation of the body has reached closure. Finally realizing that all form is intrinsically empty empty of personality. Empty of distinctive qualities such as beauty and ugliness the meditator sees the immense harm caused by Kamariga. This ruinous defilement spreads its noxious poison everywhere. It corrodes human relationships and agitates the whole world, distorting people's thoughts and emotions, causing anxiety, restlessness, and constant discontent. Nothing else has such a disquieting effect on people's lives. It is the most destructive force on earth. When Kamariga is totally eliminated, the entire world appears empty. The force that ignites fires which consume people's hearts, and fans flames that ravage human society is vanquished and buried. The fire of sexual attraction is extinguished for good nothing remains to torment the heart. With Kamariga quenched, Nibbana appears imminent and close at hand. Kamariga conceals everything, blinding us to all aspects of the truth. Thus, when Kamariga is finally destroyed, we have an unobstructed view of Maga, Phala, and Nibbana they are now well within reach. To summarize, the stage of Anagama is attained when Kamariga's stranglehold on the mind is broken. The Anagama must then practice the same investigative techniques that led to that result, deepening, broadening and perfecting them until bodily forms no longer appear within the Siddha. The mind creates images and then falls for its own creations. The fully accomplished Anagama knows this beyond a shadow of doubt. The human body, and everything that it's believed to represent, are matters of the mind deceiving itself. The body is a lump of matter, a conglomeration of basic natural elements. It is not a person, it is neither pleasing nor repugnant. It simply is as it is, existing in its own natural state. The mind perpetrates the fraud that we perceive, and is then taken in by its own false perceptions. All human organs are merely devices that the Siddha's knowing nature uses for its own purposes. The knowing presence of the Siddha is diffused throughout the whole body. This diffusion and permeation of conscious awareness throughout the body is entirely a manifestation of the Siddha's own essence. The physical elements composing the body have no consciousness, they have no intrinsic knowing qualities, no conscious presence. The knowing and the sense consciousness associated with the body are strictly matters of the Siddha and its manifestations. The eyes, ears, and nose are able to perceive through the awareness of the Siddha. These organs are merely the means by which sense consciousness occurs. They themselves have no conscious awareness. Normally we believe that our eyes are capable of seeing. But once we fully understand the body's true nature we know that the eyeball is simply a lump of tissue. The consciousness that flows through the eyes is what actually sees and knows visual objects. Consciousness uses the eyes as a means to access the visual sphere. Our organs of sight are no different from the eyeballs of a dead animal lying at the side of the road. The fleshy eye has no intrinsic value, on its own, it is basically inert. This is known and understood with unequivocal clarity. How then can the body be oneself? How can it belong to oneself? It's completely unnatural. This principle is seen clearly when the flow of consciousness that diffuses and permeates the human body is drawn back into itself and converges into a deep state of samadhi. Then the entire body exists as no more than a lump of matter a log or a tree stump. When the siddha withdraws from samadhi, conscious awareness returns to the body, spreading out to permeate every limb, every part. Awareness and the ability to know are fundamental functions of the sit and not of the physical body. 
In the normal waking consciousness of the meditator at this level of practice, the knowing presence is fully aware of itself. Aware that the Siddha and the knowing are one and the same timeless essence. And that the physical elements know nothing. In Samadhi, the body may disappear from awareness but the awareness itself never disappears. In truth, this is an immutable principle of nature. When the Kilsas infiltrate the Siddha, however, they grasp everything as oneself as me or mine thus confusing one's true nature with the sense faculties that it animates. Such is the nature of the Kilsas. Wisdom is just the opposite, it knows the body clearly for what it is and corrects this misconception. The Kilsas always grasp at the body, leading one to believe that the body is a special part of oneself. Wisdom sees the human body as just a conglomeration of common material substances, and consequently relinquishes all personal attachment to it. The brain, for instance, is a lump of matter. The brain is merely an instrument that human consciousness uses. When the Siddha enters into a deep state of calm and concentration, the conscious awareness that is normally diffused throughout the body simultaneously converges from all areas of the body into one central point of focus at the middle of the chest. The knowing quality manifests itself prominently at that point. It does not emanate from the brain. Although the faculties of memorization and learning arise in association with the brain, direct knowledge of the truth does not. Step by step, beginning with the initial stages of samadhi practice, progress in meditation is experienced and understood in the heart and only in the heart. This is where the truth lies, and the meditator who practices correctly knows this each step of the way. When it comes to understanding the true nature of all phenomena, the brain is not a factor it is not useful at all. The Siddha serene and radiant qualities are experienced at the heart. They emanate conspicuously from that point. All of the Siddha's myriad aspects, from the grossest to the most subtle, are experienced clearly from this central spot. And when all defiling influences are finally eliminated from the Siddha, it is there that they all cease. Within the Siddha, Sana and Sankara are the main agents of delusion. Beginning with the latter stages of body contemplation at the level of Anagami, these mental components of personality take center stage. When the physical component of personality the body ceases to be a factor, the Anagami's full focus automatically shifts to the mental components. Feeling, memory, thought and consciousness. Among these, the faculties of memory and thought are especially important. They arise and interact continuously to form mental images that they color with various shades of meaning. In examining them, the same basic investigative principles still apply. But instead of images of the body, the thinking process itself becomes the subject of scrutiny. Using intense introspection, wisdom observes how thoughts and memories arise and then vanish, arise and then vanish. Appearing and disappearing in an endless chain of mental activity. No sooner does a thought arise than it vanishes from awareness. Whatever its nature, the result is always the same, a thought lasts for only a brief moment and then it vanishes. The investigation zeroes in exclusively on the thinking process, penetrating right to the heart of the mind's essential knowing nature. It follows every thought, every inkling of an idea, as it arises and passes, and then focuses on the next one that surfaces. It is a time-consuming and arduous task that demands undivided attention every moment of the day and night. But by this stage, time and place have become irrelevant. This internal investigation may well continue unremittingly for weeks or months while mindfulness and wisdom wrestle with a constant flux of mental phenomena. The work is mentally very exhausting. Wisdom goes relentlessly through every aspect of mental activity. It works non-stop day and night. At the same time that it investigates the thinking process, it also makes use of thoughts and ideas to question and probe the workings of the mind in order to gain insights into its true nature. This is thinking for the sake of Magga the path of practice. It is a tool that wisdom uses for the purpose of uncovering the truth. It is not indulging in thought merely for its own sake, which is Samudaya the cause of suffering. All the same, due to the intense nature of the investigation, the mind becomes fatigued, 
and it invariably turns dull and sluggish after long hours of intense effort. When this happens, it must take a break. More than at any other time, the mind needs to rest in samadhi at regular intervals during this stage. But since the results of peace and tranquility, experienced in samadhi, pale in comparison to the truly amazing results gained from the practice of wisdom. The meditator is often very reluctant to opt for samadhi. The mind is in a vibrant, heightened state of awareness, and from that perspective samadhi seems to be a wasteful, stagnant mental state. In truth, however, samadhi constitutes an essential and indispensable complement to the practice of wisdom. So, the mind must be coerced into samadhi, if necessary. It must be forced to set aside current investigations and to focus exclusively on attaining a calm, peaceful, fully converged mental state. There, it can rest until it is completely refreshed and restored before resuming the liberating work of wisdom. As soon as the mind withdraws from the inactive state of samadhi, it will leap immediately into action. Like a horse chafing at the bit, the mind is impatient to return to its principal task the removal and destruction of all mental defilements. But take care to see that the mind does not rush frantically along the path of wisdom without any let up. Investigating to excess is one form of samudaya that can infiltrate the siddha, causing it to fall under the spell of sankharas. The very faculties of thinking and analyzing that wisdom uses to investigate the mind have a momentum of their own that knows no moderation. They must occasionally be reined in so that a proper balance is maintained between inner work and inner rest. At this stage of the practice, wisdom will automatically work at full capacity. When it is appropriate to rest, focus on samadhi with that same degree of intensity. This is the middle way of Magga, Phala, and Nibbana. The Siddha and its relationship to the Namakandas are the central focus of the investigation at this level. The Siddha is the essential knowing nature at the core of our being. It consists of pure and simple awareness, the Siddha simply knows. Awareness of good and bad, and the critical judgments that result, are merely conditions of the Siddha. At times, their activities may manifest as mindfulness, at other times, as wisdom. But the true Siddha does not exhibit any activities or manifest any conditions at all. It is simply a state of knowing. The activities that arise in the Siddha, such as awareness of good and bad, or happiness and suffering, or praise and blame, are all conditions of the consciousness that flow out from the Siddha. Since they represent activities and conditions of the Siddha that are, by their very nature, constantly arising and fading. This sort of conscious awareness is always unstable and always unreliable. Understood in this way, Sana, Sankara, and Vinayo are all conditions of the Siddha. These conditions create the flux of mental phenomena that we call the Namakandas. Through the interaction of feeling, memory, thought and consciousness, forms and images arise within the Siddha. The awareness that knows them is the Siddha. Defiling influences like Kamaraga manipulate and color the quality of that knowing. So long as the Siddha, under the authority of Kamaraga, believes this internal imagery to be real and substantial, desire and aversion will occur. Internalized forms are then cherished or despised according to their perceived nature either good or bad, attractive or repulsive. The Siddha's perspective is then divided between these two extremes. It is tricked into identifying with a world of duality and instability. The Siddha's knowing does not arise or pass away, but it mimics the traits of those things like the Kilsas and the Kandas that do. When wisdom finally sees through the deception, the Siddha no longer harbors these phenomena although they continue to arise and vanish in the sphere of the Kandas. The Siddha is thus empty of such phenomena. One moment after another from the day of our birth to the present, the Kandas have risen and fallen away continuously. On their own, they have no real substance and it is impossible to find any. The Siddha's interpretation of these phenomena lends them a semblance of personal reality. The Siddha clings to them as the essence of oneself, or as one's own personal property. This misconception creates a self-identity that becomes a burden heavier than an entire mountain, a burden that the Siddha carries within itself without gaining any benefit. 
Dukkha is its only reward for a misconceived attachment fostered by self-delusion. When the Siddha has investigated these things and can see them with the clarity born of sharp, incisive wisdom, the body is understood to be a natural phenomenon that is real within the limits of its own inherent physical qualities. It is not intrinsic to oneself and so it is no longer an object of attachment. Bodily feelings painful, pleasant, and neutral feelings that occur within the body are clearly real, but they are only a reality within their specific domain. They too are relinquished. But wisdom is as yet incapable of seeing through the subtle feelings that arise exclusively within the Siddha. So psychological and emotional feelings painful, pleasant, and neutral feelings that occur only within the Siddha are conditions that continue to interest the Siddha. Although the Siddha is unable to understand the truth about them now, these subtle feelings will serve as constant reminders, always prompting the Siddha to investigate them further.